All right, welcome everybody to the Physics Colloquium. It's my honor to introduce as our first speaker of 2023, Crystal Knoll of Duke University. Crystal attended MIT and she got her PhD from Berkeley in 2019, working with Hartman Hefner on sources of noise and surface ion traps. And then she had a spectacularly productive postdoc at the University of Maryland and Chris Monroe's group, in which she had a pivotal role in a series of pioneering experiments, including demonstrations of quantum error correction, phase transitions, and monitored quantum circuits. And what we'll hear about today, proofs of quantumness. And then last year in 2022, Crystal joined the faculty at Duke and the Duke Quantum Center, uh, where she is an, an assistant professor of electrical and computing engineering and also in the Department of Physics. I think I can say without fear of a contradiction that Duke is the world's leading center of ion trap quantum computing, and they're proud to have Crystal now on their faculty. So uh, please join me in welcoming Crystal Noll. Thank you, John, for that very kind introduction. Um, and it's good to be here in sunny California with all of you. Uh, I've actually really enjoyed it's my first time at Caltech, being on campus and everything. And thank you to my host um, for having me. Uh, so I am an experimentalist. I build quantum computers. I run them. Um, so forgive me any uh, theory uh, points during this talk. Um, most of the experts are actually in the audience and right in front of me, Laura. So uh, to direct your questions right to her, I'm sure she's loving me for this. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm at Duke and we're in New Quantum Center in the last uh, year or so. Actually, this picture was our first group photo about a year ago um, at our inaugural uh, kind of event that we had for the center. Um, we're growing obviously very quickly uh, and doing all kinds of great work in quantum and largely in, in trapped ions, which is what I'll be talking about today. Uh, so I want to start by first defining kind of what I mean by a test of quantumness, kind of a weird thing to say. Um, so let me just kind of get us all on the same page. Okay, so uh, we'll start with this, and these are my personal definitions. Please don't take this as any kind of textbook definition of anything. I'm sure you'll hear different things from different people, but for me, this is, this is what you're getting today. Okay, so in terms of a test of quantumness, what I mean is that uh, there's behavior demonstrated beyond classical expectation. Okay, so what's a, an example of that? Well, we have the, the Nobel Prize, the most recent Nobel Prize in physics for violations of Bell's inequality. And so in, in experiments by Aspe, Clauser, and Zeilinger, they, they were able to show this um, idea of a test of quantumness, behavior beyond what you would expect from classical light. So these experiments work like this. Um, it, it's just kind of a simple um, version of it. You have some source of entangled photons in this uh, particular uh, example, uh, these are calcium atoms. And you send them off in different directions and, and measure in different uh, bases of the polarization. And so on this side, this basis is fixed. And on the other side, you rotate the polarization of this measurement. And you look at correlations between the measurements on the two sides. And um, you know, so if we look at the signal versus how you rotate this, this other basis, you'll see something like this, where um, when, you, when you have signal outside of a certain range, then you violate it an inequality and shown uh, behavior beyond classical uh, possibilities. Now, a, a test like this has, you know, at the beginning had lots of loopholes. And since then, many of those loopholes have been closed. Like for example, maybe a signal was sent from this detector to the other detector to create some correlation. Um, but, you know, this is kind of the, the fundamental test of, of quantumness that kind of a canonical example. Okay, but what if we can do better than that? Um, something that can't be tricked. And so this is what I'll call a proof of quantumness. And in this case, instead of um, relying on purely quantum mechanical behavior, 
we make a cryptographic assumption and then create a secure test of quantumness based on those assumptions of some problem being hard. Um, so an example of that uh, is factoring. We don't have a, a known polynomial classical algorithm for factoring. Uh, so if we can base our test on the hardness of that problem, then we can be um, sure in some sense that, uh, that the behavior that we're seeing is not classical. And, and I'll talk more about this. This is going to be the topic of the rest of my talk today. And just to kind of clear up beyond that, um, you know, there's this idea of quantum advantage. And quantum advantage is a similarly kind of a test of quantumness, uh, but it has this extra kind of idea that you've done something that's beyond the class community of computation. In the case of these spell inequality violations, you can you know, write down this piece of paper based on quantum mechanics, what's happened and, and understand that. Um, but there are certain things that um, as Feynman suggested that should be done with quantum systems um, because they're more efficient at it and we don't have a, a, a good way of doing them classically. And so if you can do something beyond any current classical computer, then you've done something with quantum advantage. Uh, and so there have been examples of that that made quite a splash. Um, in the recent past, so we have noisy circuit sampling um, in the superconducting qubits and then boson sampling in these photonic systems, um, where you're looking at the, again, these kind of distributions and the correlations and um, finding things that are, are beyond uh, supposedly classical computational power. However, um, as has been shown since these demonstrations, especially you know, noisy circuits, um, defining what current classical means is really only depends on how good your two computer is and how clever you are and, and how you compute these things. Uh, and so that's really not the best test. Uh, and more importantly, the verification of these results has exponential costs. So I do need to get out that supercomputer uh, and you know maybe it takes a few days on it um, in the case of, I think, IBM. Um, computing this, this noise circuit result directly. Um, so we'd like something that we can instead verify in polynomial time, um, just with a, a, a regular laptop or whatever. Okay, so, so we come back to this list and now, you know, let's say you could do something with these cryptographic um, proof of quantumness where you have many, many qubits and then you can achieve something that looks like quantum advantage that is now um, verifiable. And I'll talk about what that means. So in this talk, I am not going to show you quantum advantage. Okay, we're just going to be talking about proof of quantumness on a level that you know is still simulatable on your computer, but still the first experimental demonstration of it. And the way we're going to do that is using interactive protocols. So the idea in an interactive protocol is you have a verifier, your classical verifier, and you have a quantum prover. And so this verifier is trying to check and see if uh, the prover is truly quantum or have they done something beyond what is possible classically. And you do this through, through a series of interactions where the verifier sends a challenge and the prover sends a response and you can go back and forth um, a certain number of times until the, the verifier is satisfied. Um, and then you can repeat this interaction many times um, to increase your confidence in, in the prover's quantumness. So this is going to be um, the, the basis of the, the protocols that I'll talk about. Um, and there's been some you know, pioneering theory work here at CalPath on this, and our collaborators are, are here as well as at Berkeley. OK, so for the rest of my talk, I'll get into the hardware. Uh, and show you kind of the fundamentals of how our quantum computer works. Then I'll talk about the, the protocols themselves on a pretty high level. And then I'll dig into how we do the interactions, uh, which requires a mid-circuit measurement. Uh, and then I'll talk about a variation on these protocols with a hash function. Okay, so our quantum computer is based on trapped ions, as I mentioned. And um, so this, in this example, um, in this machine that I'll talk about today, we use a terbium-171, which has this level structure. And it has this nice um, qubit in the ground state here. 
that split by 12.6 gigahertz uh, that, that we'll use as our qubit. And there are various transitions that we can use for cooling, state preparation. Um, and you know, these are largely accessible with kind of visible lasers off the shelf. So it makes it um, nice to work with and easier to, to scale. In the, in the case of Euterbium, it's a very long lived qubit. The T1 time is essentially infinite, and the T2 time can be made um, somewhat arbitrarily long in terms of the microwave coherence time at 12.6 gigahertz. So um, this is a T2 measurement on a chain of 15 ions, um, and we see over four seconds, and this is just limited by our microwave oscillator. Uh, so I, I mentioned you know, this measurement was in a chain of 15 qubits. So what we do with these ions, we trap them in a long linear chain like this. Um, and the ions are all uh, coupled together through their columbic interaction. And we do this using these uh, surface traps that are microfabricated chip traps that we get from Sandia National Laboratories. We do our detection and cooling using lasers, as I mentioned. So in this case, the, the cooling light is the 369 um, transition. It's also what we use for readout. So this is our qubit. Again, here we have the zero and one in the ground state. And uh, we shine in the 369 light and so that it's resonant with the one state to this excited state. So if it emits more photons, then we know we are in one state. And if we see no photons, then we know we're in zero. So we collect. Um, the photon can make a histogram like this and draw a line, and we can get um, so over 99% detection fidelity with, without very much work. And the way we do this with long chains, so we can collect the light from each ion individually. So it's a little hard to see in this picture, but there are 32 separate fiber cores here in an array. So you take our equally spaced chain of ions, and we image them onto this array of fiber cores such that each ion is separately detected on its own detector at the other end of this fiber. So we have um, virtually no crosstalk in our detection. Our qubit operations are done using a pulse laser at 355 nanometers and a Raman transition. So we are detuned from this um, excited P state here. And it, it absorbs into one beam and emits into the other. And, we can create any superposition of zero and one that you like. And then in the case of these long chains, we use an array of tightly focused beams so that each ion has its own individual control of, of these gates. Um, and then the second Raman beam is a global beam that addresses the entire chain. But with this, we're able to arbitra arbitrarily control the, the frequency, phase, amplitude of each ion and do individual independent gates. Our entangling gates are done through the motion. So I mentioned that the ions are coupled through a Coulomb interaction um, since they're trapped in the same trap. And yeah, my video is kind of working. So um, we turn on the, the beams of choice. So in this case, we turned on two laser beams. And this excites the motion of the ions and couples the spin to the motion. So the motion acts as a quantum bus. And then we end up with spin-spin entanglement. And by doing this in a long chain, we can connect any pair of ions. So we have um, full connectivity in a single chain of all of the qubits. And we can also engineer these motional modes that we're using to generate the entanglement um, using these, these complex microfabricated chaps that we have um, so that we can create uh, different interactions and um, also optimize gate pulses around those modes. Uh, and so in this example, of a, this is a, a gate pulse that we use to do a gate on a particular pair of ions, and we modulate the amplitude of the laser. And so what we're left with is what we call our, our native gate, the icing gate, which is an XX interaction that looks like this. Um, and we can do this on any pair in the chain. So altogether, this gives us all the ingredients for our quantum computer. So this is kind of a snapshot of the capabilities that we had um, at the time when this machine was actually at University of Maryland. So the, the experiments I'll talk about today were done at Maryland. And this is a picture of what um, the machine looked like there. Um, so we had, we're working typically with 13 qubits, all to all connectivity. Our two qubit gate fidelity is right around 99%. 
And our single cubic gate fidelity is over 99.9 .9 with some small SAM errors. So this is going to be our um, computer that we'll use to do these tests with Quantumus. And um, so I've talked about kind of each particular component that we use. But when building a system like this, we really have to look at it as a system. And so um, just to give kind of a perspective on, on how this is really not you know, a, a simple tabletop AMO experiment anymore, we really have to approach this with quantum systems engineering principles. So we start with our qubit down at the bottom. These are our ions, right? Then we have our layer of physical control. So we're doing, um, we're manipulating all of these laser beams uh, with some, um, for maybe any experts, these are our system on the chip um, systems that are commercial. And we use, um, we collaborate with L3 Harris, the company that makes all of our optics for our Raman addressing. Uh, so on the physical control layer, we really rely on a lot of engineered systems that the experts have really built for us. Uh, and then we incorporate them into the system. So we're not um, duct taping anything together here. On the next layer, we use a pretty common software among ions, Arctic, uh, as well as a, like a homegrown Duke Arctic extensions um, that provide a lot of different capabilities that we need across all kinds of ion experiments. So we're able to automatic, uh, automate things, like in this case, I'm showing uh, loading of a chain. This is a real-time video. Uh, and so we can press the button, say, you know, I want a chain of 15 qubits, please. Press the button, and within a few minutes, there they are. So this is something that has, um, is previously not necessarily what you think of in an atomic physics experiment, um, but it's enabled by this use of common software and really thinking about it as a system um, with components that need to be highly functioning. And then on the back end, uh, for the quantum circuit compiler, we use Piskit. Um, to compile all of those pulses. And then of course we can work our way up to near term algorithms and hopefully quantum advantage. Uh, so what do those applications and algorithms look like? John mentioned some of these um, in the introduction. But just to highlight, you know, there's once you have this universal quantum computer, it's really a playground for us as experimentalists. Uh, I get to learn about a different um, physics or computer science or chemistry topic every time I do one of these projects. Um, and so these are just some, some recent examples. We've worked on error fraction, um, these phase transitions, we've done some NMR simulations. Um, so it's just a, a, a lot of fun to be, to be doing this with these very capable machines. Okay, so that's our hardware. So now I'm going to talk about um, the protocols in a little more detail. Okay, so we're doing, again, these interactive protocols. And the idea here is we want to leverage cryptographic functions, and then we'll use interactions back and forth where we're going to enforce consistency in all of those interactions and thereby um, prove that the, the quantum prover has this power. So this, uh, these interactions kind of let us um, take this problem from something that uh, is difficult to implement to something that's easier to implement, but also verifiable. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about that. OK. And so to, to give some kind of names to these interactions, so first the verifier will set up the problem. And then the prover has to commit to an answer. So they send an answer back um, to the verifier while keeping the rest of their quantum state. So that's the key here, is that the prover has to keep the quantum state that they've created and just committed to by sending some information to the verifier. So the, this is kind of where the, the power of this comes from, that after this commitment has been made, the verifier now gives you a new challenge. And the only way that you can respond to that challenge in the correct way is if you truly have the right quantum state. And I'll, I'll talk about how exactly how that works. And the cryptographic functions that we're going to leverage are in particular these two to one trapdoor claw free functions. So I'll break that down one at a time. So the first thing is that these functions should be easy to compute. If I give you an input, you can easily tell me what the output is of that function. It's two to one, which means that exactly two inputs correspond to each output. Claw free means that finding that pair, that two to one pair, is hard. 
except there is a trap door. And so this trap door is a secret key that you can use to find that colliding pair. But without the trap door, this is very hard. So these are going to be the key properties of these functions that we're going to use. So in particular, the verifier, the classical verifier, is going to hold on to that trap door. And they're not going to tell the prover that trap door. And that's where this, this security comes from. Um, and then the fact that it's claw free um, is what we're going to use to see that um, classically, it's very hard to find the colliding input pair, but quantumly we can, we can do it. Okay, so the two functions that we use uh, are the learning with errors problem based on learning with errors and uh, Raven's function. And so in learning with errors, we have a, a, a system of equations, just a, a some matrix multiplied by a particular vector, and then there's some error on that. So without the error, you could just invert this, just a simple matrix multiplication. But when you add this error to it, this becomes a known hard problem. And then we uh, construct this uh, particular TCF based on that problem um, using rounding, and I will not get into the theory of how all of that works. Uh, and then in the other case, um, we have this x squared mod n function, where n is some large number that is the product of two primes. So if you could factor n, uh, which is also a hard problem, you could solve this problem. Um, but by using this interactive protocol, we don't have to factor n. Turns out Factoring we can do in a quantum way with Shor's algorithm, but that's really difficult. We'll take thousands of error factor qubits. So we'd like to find something a little easier than that. So this is based on the same element of hardness, but easier to implement. OK. Um, and so in, in the case of um, uh, this one, the trap door itself is these, this prime decomposition of that number. So if you know the prime factors, then that's the trap door so that you can find you can um, verify that the input pair is correct. And then there's one other sort of technical detail that, again, I won't have time to get into. Um, there's something called a hardcore fit. And in the case of learning with errors, it uses this hardcore fit. So we only need um, two rounds of interaction. But in, uh, in this case, we uh, don't have the hardcore fit until we have an extra round of interaction. It just makes it a little more difficult to do experimentally. OK, so in the case of both protocols, they start with the prover preparing a superposition according to whatever um, particular setup, this function that the verifier has sent over. The prover then makes a measurement on the output register. So we're committing to an output of that function and then reports that result to the verifier. So this first step is that uh, important commitment. So the, then the, the prover holds the state that is essentially a, has a superposition of the two collide, the colliding pair, the two inputs that gave that output um, that they just sent and committed to. So now um, you can kind of already see that, you know, this is a, a superposition. So that's an inherently quantum state uh, between these two inputs. And I've now committed to their corresponding output um, that I've sent to the verifier who can immediately use the trap door and they basically know what superposition I'm holding if I'm truly quantum. Okay, so now we want to validate that they actually have a superposition. So there's two ways you can do that. You can either say, okay, just, just measure. And we know from quantum mechanics, we'll get either one input or the other. And then the verifier can, can quickly say that that was the right input. In the other test, um, we essentially do an interference measurement. So we have our superposition, we rotate the basis, and then we measure. And um, again, I'm not, don't really have time to go into details here, but essentially either you're measuring in the computational basis, in the Z basis, as you normally would, or you're measuring in the Hadamard basis by interfering the two inputs. And the, the important point here is that at this stage of the protocol, the prover doesn't know which tests they're going to be asked for. So if they had um, somehow cheated and they had one of the inputs, but then were asked for the, you know, the, the interference test, they couldn't do it. Or if they had done the interference test ahead of time, but then were asked for that, that input, again, they would fail. So this in inherently requires kind of quantum um, coherence and after that commitment. 
Okay, so the protocol continues. So this is what I was just talking about. You choose whether you measure in X or Z. Um, and then in the case of learning with errors, then you just send those measurement results over and that's it. But then um, in the case of the other function, um, it requires another round of interaction to just um, correct for that lack of a hard purpose. But essentially it amounts to the same kind of decision at the end, which basis do you measure that last qubit in? Okay. So these are the actual instances of the function that we use. So um, we have these small matrices in the case of one of the errors, and then we go all the way up to n equals 21 in the case of the factory-based protocol. Um, so the, the first task is that you have to actually compute the function to get those inputs, the colliding pair. And so we do that using quantum circuits that, again, it's very long time to get into all the details of those. Um, in the case of the learning with error-based protocol, we use up to nine qubits. And in the factory-based protocol, it's up to 11. And the important thing here to note are in the red boxes, right? The, this is an interaction. And so you have to have some way to measure part of your state while keeping the rest of your state and waiting for that challenge. So it requires that you you do a partial measurement on your system, also known as a mid-circuit measurement, um, without disturbing the state of the qubits that, that need to stay until you get that decision on what challenge you're going to answer. And so this became kind of the next challenge for us experimentally. How do we do these partial readouts of ions? Um, if you remember, I talked before about how we do readout, we shine laser in, uh, and this, um, Laser causes the ion to emit more photons. Uh, and so if you have two ions next to each other, those photons can now go to the neighbor and read out the neighbor and maybe you didn't intend to do that. Um, so fundamentally, this is difficult in this particular architecture. So what we'll have to do is move the ions out of the way. So we start with our chain here with our individual graphing beams in this particular um, kind of center zone. Then we split the chain into two pieces here and um, move these qubits that we want to keep coherent. We move them out of the way of the readout beam, out of the way of the other ions, and then read out um, the qubits that we do want to measure. And so this is a video of that happening um, kind of in a slowed down version, obviously, where we actually do this twice. So we split the chain once here, we have the two halves, and then we bring this chain pass the chain back to the center, and then we actually split it again. Um, so we developed the solutions that are needed to do all this moving of the ions, splitting the chain deterministically at a certain point. So we're taking those qubits that we want to measure and leaving the others intact. Um, so, okay, so uh, we can do an experiment to see, you know, how, how good are we at doing this? Are we really keeping those other qubits coherent? And so we start with the chain, separate it into two, and then bring it back together. And then we can turn this into a Ramsey experiment if we do a prior two pulse at the start and um, put them in the X basis, do our, our shuttling, and then um, bring them back together and do our readout pulse. Okay, so um, in this plot, I'm showing a, a Ramsey friend who essentially tell us, you know, are they still coherent when they come back to center? And in the yellow, we have the qubits that have not been detected. And in the blue, we have the qubits that were detected. So we shuttle half of them away, we measure these and leave these, and we see that we still have a good Ramsey fringe. Okay, so that's great. Um, there's one other sort of um, caveat here that happens. Our ions are physically traveling through space. And so they're traveling through um, magnetic fields, and they're accumulating various phases depending on the path that they just took through space. Um, and we can see this. So when we, um, if you don't shuttle and you just do the transient experiment, all the curves line up. However, if you do the shuttling, you bring them back, um, we can see that the half that was shuttled has a different phase than the half that was not. Uh, and so this is something that we can just calibrate for. So it's very stable. We do this once, and then we can get it back to this overlapping um, overlapping curves with uh, a simple RD gate thrown in there. Okay, 
So now we can look at the results of this protocol. We're able to do mid-circuit measurements. We're able to do all of our gates. Um, and so these are the results. So I'm, what I'm plotting is the passing rate of the first test where you just measure the input versus the passing rate of the interference test. And um, there's this idea of this threshold where um, a classical prover could only do as well as this threshold. And we have both the case of this interact when we have this interactive measurement, we're doing all the shuttling and the measuring. And then we also do a case where we do no mid-circuit measurements, we just run it through um, without the interaction. So this kind of tells us the cost of doing that mid-circuit measurement on our results. And so you can see that and you know, it, it does uh, cost us in, in the fidelity of those results, but we're still well above this classical threshold. And this is in the case of um, LWE, and then we also have the factory-based protocol. And so in this case, we were only able to do the interaction with the smallest case of uh, n equals eight. And even without interaction, we fail the n equals 21 test. So we're really at the limit here of what our machine can do. And this is, this is truly due to just the sheer number of gates um, and our given fidelities um, when running the circuits. Okay, and then we can dig a little bit more into um, these results. So in the case of the LW based protocol, we can see, um, so what I'm, what I'm showing here is the different instances that we ran. And on one branch is that input pre-image test. And on the other branch is the interference test. And in the case where we just measure in the computational basis, what you see is that the interactive versus no interaction, they perform about the same. And that's because our um, qubits are very stable throughout all the shuttling. So if we don't care about the phase and we're just measuring in the computational basis, we get the same result whether we do all of this or not. Um, however, we do suffer a large cost in the interference test because of the phase errors due to all of that shuttling. And what we can see in the factoring based protocol, so now we have many more branches because of the um, two interactions in this protocol. So it's just more um, complicated results, but um, what we can see is that it seems like um, somehow the interactive version almost it performs better in some cases. Uh, so how does that happen? Well, this is essentially a bell test. So you've done better on one branch at the expense of the other. So you can see that the other branches are, are doing much worse. Um, so in the same way you can think you're kind of cheating at a bell test, you can systematically bias um, your detector in one direction, but this comes at a cost in the other basis. Okay, so that's all well and good. We can do our interactive protocols. Um, we're, we're, you know, confident in their security and our technical ability to do our mid-circuit measurements. Um, and now I'm going to tell you that we don't actually need any of that. Okay, so we'll take this protocol and instead of doing any of these interactions, what we'll do is just replace them with a hash function. And um, okay, so let's let's look at what this looks like. So I started, we start with the same steps, so we're still going to send the same problem, compute the same output, commit to, to a colliding pair. Um, and then we take that superposition and we apply a hash function. And so in this case, what I'm talking about is a, what could also be called a, a random oracle. And this is something that you can evaluate classically for a single input. You just uh, can, can classically get the output of this hash function where you take some number of bits and turn it into a, a single bit. And so for an example, um, this is what we use um, in, this, in this particular application. It's just a small hash function where you're combining um, these bits in a certain kind of random way. Ideally, when you're at scale and you really want to prove that you're secure, you would use some kind of hash function that's standardized by NIST um, so that it's truly secure. And in our quantum prover, we can evaluate this hash in superposition. So you have, you know, all the, you could, for example, put in all possible inputs with the hash function and then compute on your output register the output of that hash function. So we take that hash, which is just this 
so again, com combination of classical bits in a way. And then we evaluate it um, with a quantum circuit by basically throwing the result of that hash function into the phase here. And then much in the way of many um, quantum algorithms, then we can just extract the result from this phase. So we add this hash function circuit onto our same circuit from before. But, um, and so we take that superposition of the two inputs. So we have our x0 and x1 given our output that we've already sent to the verifier. So we are committed to these inputs. And now we've created a superposition that also has this result of the hash in the phase of x1. So now we do our measurement in the Hadamard basis interfere in order to read out that phase. Um, but there's now no longer a mid-circuit measurement. We just measure all of the qubits at the end. So we'll call the output of um, this result D. So this is the kind of the what, what's come out of our input register. The W remember is the output of this output register. And then we have this extra hard part bit, and this is the um, L of E, and that comes out of M. And then if you remember from before, we had these two different tests, input and we had the interference. And now we're just doing, um, it's like we're kind of doing both of those at once. But um, yeah, so we can do this with just one single step because of the use of this hash function. So we, we return the results of, of these measurements and then the verifier can find the flaw using the trapdoor and then similarly calculate the hash function and verify the output. Okay, so we have the results of this. So in this case, we use the same instances from before for the LWE-based protocol. And um, these are just showing different external repetitions. And we have 2,000 shots for each of this point. Um, and then we have the success probability um, on the y-axis here. So classically, um, you could do as well as, as 50%. You could just guess every, um, you could, yeah, basically a 50% guess. Um, and so, you know, these, we were well above the, the classical threshold. And um, you can also kind of see that it looks like a couple of the instances performed better overall than the other two. And we looked into this and turned out that the compilation in the case of those circuits um, reduced the gate count significantly enough that they were able to perform better. So there was something about those so circuits where some gates canceled nicely, and so we had a higher fidelity result. So with uh, my little bit of remaining time, and then I'll leave time for questions, um, I'll just um, kind of talk a little bit more broadly about the outlook and where we're going at DPC and with some of these quantum computers. So as I mentioned, we're a new quantum center. So we're located in downtown Durham uh, as in an old tobacco building, which is typical of downtown Durham, um, in our, our new uh, lab space as well as common spaces um, in the building. And one of the, I mean, there's lots of research going on in the center, but one of the main things that I'm involved with and kind of the main messages that we're um, working on are these quantum systems engineering. So we started with our first system that I talked about today that was built at University of Maryland. Um, and it's, pretty compact as far as a analog experiments go. It fits on just a couple of optical tables. Um, but our next generation system here uh, is currently being characterized and calibrated, um, which is even more compact. We've reduced it to half an op optical table in a rack, um, which is impressive to see if you've ever seen one of the old AMO labs with lasers across the whole table and wires everywhere. Um, so we're really working on compactifying, which keeps everything more stable and with higher fidelities, hopefully. Um, and these two projects are largely funded by MyARPA, um, and we're building more systems as we move forward. So we've got plans for um, already happening for the next one as well, with even more capabilities. So it's, it's I know I've said this before, but it's really, it's an exciting time to be um, doing this kind of work as we get more of these systems online. Um, and they are academic systems. So these are not, you know, controlled by any kind of commercial interest. Um, we get to do the science that we want to do, um, which as a scientist is mostly exciting for me. Um, so if that's 
know, something that interests you, please um, come and talk to me about it in terms of we're always looking for students and postdocs. Um, just to highlight some of my other activities, uh, the new PI, uh, we're working on kind of some of the challenges that we face to scaling to the next biggest number of qubits uh, and looking at the different materials challenges that we face and how we can integrate technologies into the chips. So kind of going all the way down to that most basic level of the devices that we use and the fabrication that we do. Uh, so there's lots of people that I should really thank. Um, as I mentioned, we have collaborated with some amazing theorists here at Caltech as well as Berkeley. Um, and in this case, we also collaborated with um, folks at INQ. Um, and uh, I mean, really these types of projects rely on having these amazing theorists who are willing to work with us um, and, and make these results happen. And then of course, these machines take a large experimental team. Um, these are just the people who were working on the system at the time um, where we uh, did this project. Our PIs, Marco Satina and, and Chris, Chris Monroe and these projects. Also just want to highlight the uh, grad students at Rizu really took um, the data on this and, and really did the, the, the hard work of um, taking all of that and getting it to work along with ORCATS, the uh, postdoc who really um, got the shuttling and the mid-circuit measurement happening. And then of course, uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors. And just again, mentioning that we have lots of new faculty at Duke. Um, we have folks in ions and atoms and theory um, of all kinds. So uh, please check us out. Uh, thank you all for listening to me today. No. So we're so the question was, um, are we solving the learning with errors problem using the quantum computer? Uh, and the answer is no. We are um, actually relying on the fact that it can't be solved. Um, well, classically, but I think there's also no quantum algorithm that solves it. Um, so we're only relying on its hardness. We're not actually solving it. And that's it's a it's a good question because it's actually kind of the key to why these interactive protocols are really interesting. Because the what we need to do to implement them is much simpler than what you would need to do to actually solve the hard problem. So it makes it more you know, tractable in terms of actually getting there. I, I know that it's a class of the data minimize the signals and messages of that problem. And that's, I don't consider that a derivative of information. What's the advantage of a quantification versus a I'm not sure I'm familiar with what you're asking, or I'm, I'm not uh, understanding I'm just, what you're asking. I'm just trying to understand the main advantage. Uh, um, so, so the the advantage is that um, the this classical verifier can very easily verify what we've done. Um, so it doesn't take them, uh, you know, a lot of classical computation to to verify at the output of what we've done. And that's because of these the construction of these types of problems. Um, and so they're they're efficiently verifiable as opposed to you know, if you are, um, you know, calculating the dynamics of some complex quantum system with many qubits, and, and but then you have no way of verifying that you've actually done the right dynamics or the right computation, um, then you can't actually verify that that you've done the computation correctly. But in this case, we can. So would it be fair to say that you claim to have quantum computers, but maybe I don't believe you? So I ask you some questions and you send me answers and after a while you convince me. 
Yeah, yeah. So the question is, if I claim to have a, just repeating for Zoom, so if I claim to have a quantum computer and John sends me some questions and I send him some answers, can he be satisfied that I indeed have a quantum computer? And yes, that's the idea with these protocols. Of course, you, you need enough qubits that these problems are actually hard. Um, and we're nowhere near that level with 10 qubits. That requires more like a thousand. Get to work. Get to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I wanted to jump on that one. So, uh, I don't understand the Yeah, so the, the, yeah, the, the question is, would it be quantum advantage if you just do this with more qubits and you're above the threshold? Yeah, the answer is yes, that's what they're, they're made for. Yeah, so I'm actually blanking on those exact numbers. I'm like what looking at Laura you? over here to see if she remembers what we figured out. <laughs> I thought it was, yeah, I thought it was thousands of qubits. Yeah. On the order of thousands. Yeah. Yeah, it's really this balance between verification and implementation. Yes. Yeah, it's to have something that's somehow, but it has to be not only verifiable, but not spoofable, right? So it has to be, um, and so in this case, we talk about it being secure in this kind of language of um, cryptography, but it, yeah, you, it, somehow it needs to be both. And so these interactive protocols seem to be kind of a sweet spot, but a thousand is still a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but that's, I mean, a challenge to the theorists. <laughs> Yeah, that would be great. When we do the mid circuit measurement, yeah, we're physically like those were videos of ions, like we're physically splitting them apart in space and 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 measuring half of them. Um, and with this particular implementation, um, this machine was not built for fast shuttling. Uh, it, it and so it it can be done faster. Um, we've since replaced the filters in particular, and now can go a little faster, um, well, significantly faster. Um, and then there's people who work on real fast shuttling without heating. So these things are possible. Um, but in this particular implementation, we kind of didn't bother. Um, and what that also means is we are not going fast. We're going so slow that, in fact, if we had just left the qubits in the chain, they'd be hotter than they were after shuttling. Because when we shuttle, they're in much shorter chains. And so this, this heating that you're talking about, it, it gets worse the longer the chain is because you're basically relaxing the trap. So um, in every experiment, there's always one over F noise. So you lower the frequency, you're more susceptible to that. Um, and so the more ions you add, the more heating you get. So by actually splitting it into smaller pieces, we reduced the overall heating in like the absolute time sense. Um, so we weren't able to see any kind of appreciable heating that affected any of what we did. Um, we also did not do any two qubit gates after shuttling. And that hints at exactly what you're talking about. So when do we need to um, deal with this heating? Uh, and it's when, if we want to do a two qubit gate afterwards, because we use the motion, we use that coupled motion for the two qubit gates. And so at that point, you would need to add a sympathetic coolant. Um, and in this system, instead of using a different species, we're using a different isotope. Uh, so we're using 172 ytterbium. Uh, and then we can cool on a narrow transition without 
disturb me our qubits and recool after all the shuttling and deal with any heating that happened. Good question. You must be an ion trapper or an ion trap enthusiast. Ion trap enthusiast. <laughs> Um, okay, so in terms of automation, if we're given a circuit uh, without any mid circuit measurement, um, it's all run down the same pipeline. So in terms of automation, that from circuit to result is, is all automated in this system. Um, when you start adding, in the case of these protocols and mid circuit measurements, it becomes more complex because you need to know which qubits you're measuring and which qubits you're not and then place them in a particular way on the chain so that you can split it and measure the ones that you want. Um, so that process I is not automated. Those were specialized um, kind of shuttling solutions that we used. Um, so they have to be pre-calculated, tested, and calibrated. Um, so however, if your um, problem that you pose uses the same split, then of course we can just do it again. Um, and so like when we did the different instances of LWE or the, the different, well, we only did the one size of the factoring, but the different instances of LWE, we didn't have to redo all of those calibrations. It was the same number of qubits that we wanted to split and measure. Um, so I guess that's a kind of a complicated answer to a simple question <laughs> of what's really automated, but, um, I think we're also getting closer to the automation of arbitrary splits. Um, it's just a matter of pre-calculating them. Um, and then you could, we did find that these calibrations of the splits were um, extremely stable. So you could calibrate that phase offset at the beginning of the day and it was fine for the whole day. Um, so once, once you have those all calibrated, maybe it takes a week to do it, but you know, Um, so when we took this data, it required um, more because of the, the, it's not even true. It's not that. So in particular, these, these circuits really pushed the limit of what this machine could do. And so it really had to be tuned to the peak of performance. Um, so it, and then once you tune it, you run the one circuit and that's it. Um, so the actual data that I showed, like, um, you know, wall clock time is, is, um, you know, minutes, um, but, but doing it, getting up to that point, of course, takes longer. Um, so this particular application is the type of thing that you, you wouldn't set it and forget it. Now, um, in the case of other applications where you're after quantity. So for example, when we're doing these types of phase transition measurements where you just need lots and lots of samples of different circuits, um, or maybe you're doing some kind of time evolution and you've got lots of different points on the curve that you're trying to do, um, then the machine can, could basically run unmanned for like overnight. You know, you're limited by silly, little technical things in the end, like a laser going out of lock um, that needs human intervention. But um, in those cases, we're able to schedule calibrations, um, schedule all the circuits that we wanted, go to bed and wake up to data, which is a lot of fun for a grad student. Professor, you'll soon have your 32 qubits sticking between the gift up and running. Uh, what are you particularly eager to do with it? Um, so what, what am I eager to do next? Um, so I am particularly excited 
by the prospect of learning about gravity with quantum computers. Um, as an experimentalist, to be able to build something that I can then use to learn about some other totally different area of physics um, is, is just like the epitome of awesome for me. Um, and so things like quantum gravity or um, also thinking about these like many body physics problems and lots of correlated um, physics that's happening, these kind of, you know, whether like maybe materials related, um, but also kind of in, in this high energy space. Um, but these types of questions that, that to me are just so in the clouds as somebody who's down in the trenches um, to think that, that, yeah, we can have anything to do with that, which is, is super cool. So yeah, I, I love thinking about like physics and, and what types of cool physics problems can we tackle with these. All right, well, it's always, it's always tough to follow up on the quantum gravity answer. So maybe the, <laughs> the time has come yes. uh, for us all to shuttle out of the lecture hall. It's not a thing. Just believe it.